Am I plugged in? Yes. First, let me assure you that I am not capable of practicing law and running an English department at the same time. Uh, that was in between uh, going from the south side up to Evanston. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today, so I want to thank the festival for asking me to uh, share what I, or contribute what I can to the larger topic of animals as we think about them um, from the, this moment in history. Uh, I want to thank you guys also for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. I think that my um, specific contribution to the larger project here is, is a historical contribution, not just a Shakespeare contribution. And what I mean by that is um, the stuff I want to talk about today will enable us to think about animal, the animal, animality, these kinds of formulations in a historical perspective. Uh, obviously, the material that I'm going to be talking about today it's not just before Darwin, it's before Linnaeus, it's before Descartes. Um, and so what I want to talk about is, well, what were the resources that contributed to thinking before that time? I'll just give you the answer in advance. The most important two sources are revived classical natural history, so Aristotle in particular, and Pliny, these classical accounts of animals, that was one major source. Uh, but the other critical resource, and it's appropriate where we are today, um, is Genesis. And as I'll hopefully unfold a little bit in my, in my talk, it's not the Genesis we automatically think we know what Genesis says. It's actually a very complicated reading of Genesis in the 16th century during the Reformation um, that reads animals a certain way uh, in the creation story. So I'll be talking about that. Um, I tend to think of myself as much as I think of myself as a lawyer or a literary scholar as a his, a historical ideas. But I do think of ideas as inseparable from the words we have available to express those ideas. Um, and so one of the things we'll be talking about today is the, the history of the very thing, the word in English, animal, because it turns out to have quite a genealogy. Um, hence my subtitle, I couldn't leave it as just Shakespeare's beasts, um, but I wanted to juxtapose the question of the word beast and the word animal and how we might think about them uh, historically. The single digit sum in my subtitle, I hope, has raised your brows. After all, the frequent appearance of those diverse creatures that we conventionally shepherd into the enclosure of the word animals stands out as a special feature of Shakespeare's work as well as the pre-modern text that made up his 16th century intellectual milieu. There are animal footprints all over this archive. This results partly from the frequency with which people in the 16th and 17th centuries encountered both living and butchered animals in their daily lives. Hardly an urban, rural, or domestic scene could be painted without an animal in it. They appear in all the records of the period, from inventories to wills to art, as a kind of punctuation in the daily grammars of Renaissance life. Jan van der Heyden's cityscape here uh, on the screen of Amsterdam's main public square, for example, dramatizes the civic visibility of dogs and horses right alongside both the town hall, so the epicenter of government, and the new church. Um, it's juxtaposition of a pack horse, as you see here, with a man who is uh, over on this side half obliterated by the bundle on his back, while in the foreground, which you see up here, um, a man and a dog rolling a hoop, so engaged in play, uh, muddies any distinction between so-called beasts of burden and creatures of leisure. Man and beast alike are all making their way, literally cheek by jowl, beneath that vast Renaissance and very Dutch sky. I want to give you a couple of examples of this kind of daily uh, texture of an animal world. In 1542, Martin Luther's household in Wittenberg included 
in addition to unnumbered horses, eight pigs, five cows, nine calves, and besides chickens, pigeons, geese, and the immortal dog, his name is Topel, which is translated blockhead or clowny, depending on how you like to translate it. Um, this immortal dog, Topel, whom Luther said he expected to meet in heaven. Now already you can see that's not strictly covered in Genesis, right? John Calvin had dogs set upon him by his opponents in Geneva, and he was known for having trouble managing his horse. Shakespeare himself records his own familiarity with the bursting energy of what he called youthful steers, unyoked. And the humanist, Michel de Montaigne, who I'll be talking about a little bit today, marveling at what he called the terrestrial creatures that live with us, unquote, wrote the most significant work on the capacity of animals of the entire 16th century. Um, in my view, one of the most pro-animal treatises ever written, and that's in the 1580s. As historian Keith Thomas describes, in the towns of the early modern period, animals were everywhere, and the effort of municipal authorities to prevent inhabitants from keeping pigs or milking their cows in the street proved ineffective. London poulterers kept thousands of live birds inside the city. For centuries, wandering pigs were a notorious hazard of urban life. Someone might want to ask me some more about pigs being charged with murder over this in the question time. Um, humans and animals, in other words, rubbed shoulders as fellow citizens in public places with rich consequences for artistic representation, and for the political imagination as well. Humans in this period simply had more frequent and ordinary contact with more animals than most of us generally now do. For a species like ours, nearsighted, with bad ears, and a terrible nose, out of sight literally is out of mind. Beyond such daily engagements that we're no longer familiar with, early modern animals also made themselves felt in the bestiary tradition uh, with its inventory of attributes. The elephant, famous for his memory, the peacock standing for pride, the dog standing for loyalty, the fearful rabbit, the fox's cunning. We all still know uh, what those animals stand for in that, from that tradition. Uh, the dog is flexible. This is a, a, a dog standing as an emblem of melancholy. There was a, a, an elaborate theory of humoral psychology, the four humors, the four elements in the body that would make you melancholy. Well, the dog was thought to have that same kind of balance. So there's the dog as a sign of melancholic feeling. Uh, another major archive for animal ideas were the recently revived classical texts of natural history. Texts like Aristotle's enormous treatise on animal variety uh, were read sometimes in Greek, mostly in Latin. Um, there was also a surge of new vernacular translations into English. And in this, this is, of course, the first 100 years or so of the printing press. Uh, classical materials like that uh, appeared in Tudor schools. Uh, as a part of the new wave of Latin learning that gave the Renaissance its name. And they were very, very widely tapped for animal lore. Bear cubs were born formless and had to be licked into shape by their mothers. Beavers chewed off their scent glands to, be, to avoid being killed for them. These glands, um, you'll really be glad to know, were understood to be an aphrodisiac for humans and also the perfect treatment for constipation. <laughs> Rabbits engaged in military thought when they devised the zigzag as a way to defeat hounds who pursued them. All of these ideas and many, many more like them uh, stemmed from classical sources that were being revived in Renaissance culture. Renaissance readers also consumed animal husbandry books as well as hunting manuals. 
Uh, many of these were translated from medieval and continental European texts um, and read in vernacular. They were sort of like pop reading in the 16th century, if you can think of it that way. Um, finally, there was a growing number of contemporary natural history writings fueled by colonial ambitions in the New World and by the rise of what we might call technoscience, um, a science committed to mastering nature instead of simply admiring it. Um, we can talk about vivisection more in the question time. I'm sure nobody likes to talk about it, um, but with the rise of anatomy uh, and then vivisection in the 16th century, and in particular the late 16th century into the 17th century, um, a discourse of mastering nature um, became more predominant than it had been. What's all this to say? Both ordinary observation, everyday life, as well as diverse kinds of reading, high and low, make the archive of images from this period what I like to call zootopian. I do not mean that as a utopia for animals. Rather, it's a place, a topos, constituted by a much more pervasive uh, cognizance of their presence than our uh, culture typically shows. Period habits of mind are also more broadly zoographic than ours. And by zoography, I mean a practice of writing that relies pervasively on animal reference and cross-species comparison. Just to mention just a couple of Shakespearean examples I know you'll be familiar with. Macbeth likens himself to a baited bear. Henry V likens himself to a tiger. The taming of a shrew notoriously likens gender as such to species difference okay. and raises the question of education and training as one of taming a wild animal. These animal references are neither rare nor exceptional. They're absolutely habitual, much more highly practiced than they are now. And this is partly due to a cosmological outlook framework in which the raw diversity of creaturely life is not only finely articulated, but it's also invested with powerful religious and moral significance. Then as now, there are different ways to grasp this vision. I mean, we might think of it as a so-called great chain of being everybody remembers from college, okay, the great chain of being. We might think of it as an indication in period terms of the virtuosity of nature's hand as an artist or a maker. We might see it as evidence of divine power. And of course, in the period, all these things overlap. In any case, Early modern writers explicitly revere what we, in a very different moment and for different and much more recent kinds of reasons, now call biodiversity. To put this another way, the repertoire of images in the writing of the period is not at all provincially human. And I think it's helpful to begin to think of our own period as increasingly uh, provincially human in our thinking. Instead, this literature is zootopian insofar as it's indelibly marked by attention to the common presence of animals in the world. <clears throat> to return to Shakespeare, animals even show up among what we might call the dramatis animalia of his plays. We have Crab, the shaggy cur you'll remember from The Two Gentlemen of Verona, who first gets offered as a love token and then is threatened with execution by hanging. Ask me about hangdog looks in the question time. Okay. There's the notoriously baffling stage direction in The Winter's Tale. Exit pursued by a bear. Now, the jury is still out how would that have been staged? Okay. Now, if you know The Winter's Tale, it's not the most common of Shakespeare's play, plays, but it's sort of a, it's called a tragic comedy. It's a hybrid with comic and tragic elements. The bear's kind of right in the middle of it. Um, it's theoretically possible 
that a guy in a bear suit ran out. In that case, you're laughing. But it's also possible that they got a bear from the bear garden next door to the Globe Theater and had a live bear in some way pursue someone as they exit. Then it would be really scary. And so scholars debate, was it a real bear? We, da we don't know. Then there are the dogs in the tempest who sound out a bow wow, which is called a burden dispersedly uh, sung to Ariel's song. In the first folio of Shakespeare's work, this is a picture of it in 1623, uh, not picture taken in 1623. This is the 1623 text, the folio, which I took a picture of in 2000 and now. Um, you can see that Bow Wow is given a very interesting spelling right in the middle of the page here. Um, if you want to know how Bow Wow was pronounced in the 16th century, um, there you go. That's how it was pronounced. Bow Wow, I don't know. Um, note the spelling in any case. And if we tried to number all of the specific kinds of animals Shakespeare mentions, the winter lion, the Hyrcanian tiger and the baited bear, the little shrew and the necessary cat, bottled spiders and horned toads, brave hearts and gentle hinds, the forward horse and the preposterous ass, the temple haunting martlet, the morning lark, the nightly owl, and the crow making wing to the rookie wood, the nibbling sheep, the hunger starved wolves, the chafed boar, the princely palfrey, the fat ox, the spotted leopard, the stranger curs, mastiffs, and occasional hellhounds, we would be, as the saying goes, herding cats. So in what way, then, can I possibly be saying, as my subtitle began, that there are only eight animals in Shakespeare? While references to those creatures we now lump together and routinely call animals defy inventory, the English word animal itself, a generic collective noun, appears a mere eight times across the entire verbal expanse of Shakespeare's work. By contrast, Shakespeare recorded the term beast 129 times and the term creature 107 times. In this pattern, hardly any use of the word animal, overwhelming use of beast or creature instead, uh, and maybe in no other way, but Shakespeare is completely ordinary, completely typical of texts of his time in that, in that word distribution. As the Oxford English Dictionary confirms, and it's fair to say that's like a Bible in my line of work, uh, the word animal itself hardly appears in English before the end of the 16th century. In other words, it comes into vernacular usage roughly during the period of Shakespeare's working life the 1590s, and the first decade or so of the 17th century. What does the relative scarcity of this collective noun, despite the extraordinary menagerie we find in the plays themselves, suggest about our present way of speaking about humans and animals? Our habits of speech reflexively invoke the more basic dualism of human and animal, or human versus animal the so-called human-animal divide of modern philosophy and literature alike. None of these phrases, obviously, are thinkable without the word animal. Also at stake is when and why it became conventional to speak using the two adjectives that we convert into mightily abstract categories, the human. Okay? That's an adjective turned into a noun, the animal. That's an adjective turned into a noun. Uh, it's very hard to pin down what the noun actually means. As if the human and the animal by a definite article could guarantee that there's only one way to be a human, and more obviously implausible, 
only one way to be every animal from the oyster to the ape. In our modern duality, humanness essentially hangs on a generally positive attribute, however slippery, language, a soul, existential freedom, tool use, awareness of death, just to name a few. While animality correspondingly refers to some deficit of that thing, and that deficit serves as the signature feature of animals as such. If the extreme generality of terms like the human and the animal leaps out on briefest reflection, why do these terms still shape and dominate our vocabularies? Historical attention to our lexicons for living things can date what we even now, despite Darwin and despite evolution, just keep calling the human-animal divide. The phrase is a modern rhetorical proposition. It's not a timeless opposition. It enacts over and over again what it claims just to describe. As a proposition, it descends from Enlightenment science and philosophy. In particular, it traces its pedigree to Descartes' famous coinage at the dawn of techno-science in 1637, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Among all the other things that the cogito doctrine does, it also inaugurates what we should think of as a species definition of the human for modernity. I think everyone has heard, I think therefore I am invoked in countless contexts. And I think since we're so close to uh, the Magnificent Mile, it's worth recalling the most contemporary twist on it, I shop therefore I am. But few of us realize that Descartes' species definition for humanity explicitly depended on defining all other animals as entirely mechanical objects, a process that went forward partly through the 17th century rise of vivisection. The Cartesian doctrine known as la bête machine, the beast machine doctrine, explicitly called a thinking humanity from the balance of other creatures who were then entirely enclosed within the mechanistic limits of purely instinctual behavior, what Descartes called the disposition of their organs. And they were thus made indistinguishable from machines. And again, vivisection and experiments in the vacuum tube which sucked the air out of a glass chamber were critical to showing the beast as a machine by putting them in a machine and making them like a machine. We'll talk about that more. Descartes' formula yoked humans and animals together in what has to be seen historically as a particularly adverse definition. And the human-animal divide he inaugurated has proved lasting indeed. Few contemporary humanists or philosophers, for example, would deny evolutionary theory as an account of what Darwin rather poetically, I think, called a community of descent shared between humans and animals. But our continuing invocations of the human-animal divide, and its more theoretical variant, the question of the animal, perpetuate an absolute sense of the difference. Our vocabularies keep reenacting a categorical alterity that's a little bit at odds with our genealogical and genetic understandings. As vestigial traces of a Cartesian scheme, our habits of phrase still treat humans and animals as if they'd sprung up on different planets by different laws instead of having evolved in one cosmos. To put my thesis then in the most tendentious way, before Descartes' cogito, there was no such conceptual thing as the animal, as we routinely abstract it now. There were brutes and there were beasts, hence my title today, Shakespeare's Beasts. There were creatures, there were fish and fowl, there were living things. There were humans who participated in animal nature and who shared with animals the exact same four humors, as I said before. These humans were measured just as much in contradistinction to angels on the one side and to plants and minerals on the other as they were to animals. They took their place 
within a larger cosmography. None of these earlier classifications line up with a fundamentally modern sense of the animal. Shakespeare. Shakespeare, by contrast, like his predecessors and contemporaries, wrote from this larger view on the cosmos as creation. That understanding drew on highly durable, and it's worth highlighting here, highly textual uh, ideas called the book of nature or the history of creatures. So there, it was a, it's also known as the two books tradition. There's the book of scripture and the book of nature, and you don't need to be literate to read the latter, but it says the same thing. Okay. That tradition is very, very important here. Partly theological and scriptural, and partly empirical and classically derived, these notions undercut a simple sense of humanity as freestanding. These ideas also made language, and even writing itself, no human monopoly. Instead, to give a scriptural instance of the persuasive force attributable, attributable to animals, and this is from the book of Job, and you all know this one, ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of heaven, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall show thee, or the fishes of the sea, and they shall declare unto thee, who is ignorant of all these, but that the hand of the Lord hath made these, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Um, that's from the Geneva Bible, the vernacular translation in 1587. To reconnect a very familiar Shakespearean passage to this larger principle, in his Woodland Exile, uh, as you like its duke, you'll know this phrase just as well as the biblical passage, I suspect, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brook, sermons in stone, and good in everything, unquote. This good in everything suggests that all existing things worthily testify. These passages also both show that even elemental materials like water, earth, and stone are understood to participate in this cosmic voicing. The modern word animal itself embeds within it a very tense merger of classical and biblical perspectives. Despite their alleged lack of an immortal soul in most Judeo-Christian contexts, animals are called by the name of anima, Ironically, a Latin noun meaning soul, breath, or spirit. Aristotle's widely influential text, titled in Latin for general purposes, De Anima, on the soul, had postulated the ensouledness, that's the way Aristotle is typically uh, translated, the ensouledness of all living things and non-living things, offering a hierarchy of kinds of soul, the vegetative, sensitive, appetitive, locomotive, and intellective souls. Each higher form of life in this order necessarily incorporated each kind of soul understood to be below it. Here, animatedness, or the possession of soul, likens all living things, even if a hierarchy of souls also ranks them. For example, in an early Renaissance source like Pico della Mirandola's On the Dignity of Man, this is from 1486, we see something much weirder and less dualistic than a human-animal divide. Pico does extol the great and wonderful happiness of man, but he specifies the uniqueness of the human in terms of its full participation in everything else. According to Pico's Christianized version of Aristotle's typology of souls, this is Pico, God placed in man every sort of seed and sprouts of every kind of life. The seeds that each man cultivates will grow and bear their fruit in him. If he cultivates vegetable seeds, he will become a plant. If seeds of sensation, he will grow into a brute. If rational, he will become a heavenly animal. If intellectual, he will be an angel and a son of God. Pause. 
Who does not wonder, Pico writes, at this chameleon, whoops, sorry, which we are. This passage and many others like it make a menagerie of man. As unique as human being is alleged to be, it takes a chameleon to represent him. And I think that we uh, also carry around notions of what does the chameleon symbolize? Changeability, flexibility, multiplicity. The chameleon, of course, changes its color. Right? And that goes all the way back to the bestiary tradition that we spoke of earlier as well. In Renaissance English, commonplace phrasings also manifest a more elaborate census than the impoverished dualism of human versus animal. As I've described already, animal was an uncommon word. When one category of what we call animals was intended, beast usually serves. But beast offers no synonym for the modern animal, since beast intends neither fish nor fowl, but more specifically a quadruped, usually livestock. And most significantly of all, to denote more than one subcategory of animals, a list is far, far likelier than any single collective word. To give a Shakespearean instance, and this one's from Timon of Athens, quote, we cannot live on grass, on berries, on water, as beasts and birds and fishes, unquote. This litany of kinds, beasts and birds and fishes, draws its rhythms, as you'll all immediately hear, from scripture. In the vernacular translations that were at the heart of the Reformation in England, we find the fish of the sea, the fowl of the heaven, and the beast of the field, scattered throughout the early chapters of Genesis, from the creation story to Noah's Ark. This is the illustration from the Geneva Bible of Noah's Ark. There was uh, much discussion at the time of what were the specifications of the Ark. I'll be happy to talk about that also in the question time. Some of these scriptural enumerations from Genesis ground human claims to have authority, quote, over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the heaven and over the beast and over all the earth and over everything that creepeth and moveth on the earth. Notice, though, that that is a political authority to have power or authority over them. But other passages uh, grant rights of sustenance to animals exactly as they have been conveyed to humans. Um, reading here from Genesis chapter 1, um, and it's the key verses are 29 and 30, quote, likewise to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the heaven and to everything that moveth upon the earth, that which hath life in itself, every green herb shall be for meat." Unquote. Another thing we might talk about in the question time is there are actual legal cases against animals over this right, and I'm happy to talk about that. It's a pretty interesting phenomenon in the question time, their legal liability, so to speak. Thus, the creaturely inventories in the vernacular Bibles and homilies of the Reformation reinforced an expansive cosmic census. The 16th century homily on obedience concerns the maintenance of political order among humans, but the language of order that it provides draws instead on a complex articulated cosmos. I'm going to read a passage, again appropriately here, um, from the homily on obedience from the reign of Edward in the mid-16th mid -16th century. The sun, moon, stars, rainbow, thunder, lightning, clouds, and all the birds of the air do keep their order. The earth, trees, seeds, plants, herbs, corn, grass, and all manner of beasts keep themselves in order. All the parts of the whole year as winter, summer, months, nights, and days continue in their order. All kinds of fishes in the sea, rivers, and waters, with all fountains and springs, yea, the seas themselves keep their comely course and order." Unquote. As the litany of kinds unfolds, this order seems especially heterogeneous. In vernacular cosmologies like these, early moderns attentively noted the presence of other creatures 
by listing them, uh, love of the list. And you can see uh, in, I'm going to show you two representations here of the animals boarding the ark. This was an excuse, this scene is an excuse for a painter to show his stuff. To be able to do this many different kinds of animals, to be able to demonstrate all this cloth and expertise in cloth. You'll notice with the whole two by two thing, forget about that. There's always more dogs than there could possibly have been allowed in Noah's Ark. Um, and so there's something wonderful about nature's diversity as a sign of omnipotent divinity, as prodigal, as prodigal nature. Um, so here you see you've got your terriers and you've got your sight hounds and they're all in there together, not strictly following the law. Here also uh, is a, a Dutch uh, Flemish painter from the early 17th century. This is a view of Eden before the fall. Again, this type of scene is a license to a painter to show what he can do, a, ma a mastery of this many different forms, this kind of color, the kind of absolute pleasure in almost a chaos of different bodily shapes. And there you see it. When a higher level of generality than birds, beasts, and fishes is sought, Scripture again plays a role, supplying terms, most importantly the term creature, but also living things or living beings. As an aside, this also shows us the relative accuracy of Renaissance translations of the Bible compared with all our modern counterparts that do use the word animal. Um, the, sorry, Genesis makes numerous collective references of this kind to creatures overall. For example, quote, God spake to Noah, saying, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you, with the fowl, with the cattle, and with every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark unto every beast of the earth, unquote. What's intriguing about the classificatory terminology of a passage like the Noah passage I've just read is the way that it uses both the highest general category, creatures, and the enumerative or inventorying approach to representing animal kinds. This legalistic technique, in, in legal terms also called variation, suits the putative contract that is being described in the Noah passage. Likewise, with characteristic period emphasis, pretty much every time the term creature or living creature appears in these incalculably influential religious texts, it's commonly intensified by every, every creature, every living thing, as here. But to be very, 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 very clear, the word animal, the English noun animal, never appears in the benchmark English of the Great Bible, 1539, never appears in the various iterations of the Geneva Bible from 1560 and 1587, nor does it arrive in the King James Version of the Bible in 1611. There's no word animal in any of those translations. Um, and those are three critical repositories for our understanding of the history of vernacular usage in English. Okay, what then are Shakespeare's eight animals doing? And what do they tell us? Two usages involve human individuals who are failing a gendered and class-inflected human standard. In Much Ado About Nothing, a disenchanted suitor accuses his beloved of a lack of self-government, an unchastity more intemperate, intemperate than pampered animals. In Love's Labor's Lost, a curate classifies the illiterate character who is named Dull according to, precisely according to the Aristotelian additive model of souls that I've just discussed. Dull evidences only the lower forms of soul, showing no sign of the higher intellective forms. As one speaker describes him, quote, he hath not eat paper, he hath not drunk ink, his intellect is not replenished. He is only an animal, only sensible in the duller parts, and such barren plants are set before us that 
we thankful should be for those parts that do fructify in us more than in he, unquote. Now, the logic of that passage posits distinctions among humans and animals and plants while also undercutting them by calling one human specimen a not human animal and also a plant, okay? dull. No less than three of Shakespeare's eight animals uh, inhabit as you like it. And here we've reached some real political animals. Each instance implicitly critiques the provision in Genesis about human dominion. And each does so in terms of the single most searing issue in Renaissance political thought. And that this is a searing issue because the Reformation uh, made it even more urgent. That issue is political tyranny, okay? an unrestrained monarch who has turned into a tyrant. What do you do? That's the rumination of the entire 16th century in political thought. Here's the example. Orlando, and this is an as you like it, oppressed by a brother who denies him an education, laments, quote, I gain nothing under him but growth, i.e. he gets food, for the which his animals on his dunghills are as much bound to him as I. The spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against this servitude. Meanwhile, in Arden's Woods, in the same play, the melancholic figure of Jaques observes a wounded stag. He calls him a wretched animal who heaves forth groans. That Jaques calls the human, and, and Jaques calls the humans taking over the forest, a very important passage in the play, quote, mere usurpers, tyrants, and what's worse, unquote. Oh, sorry. Mere usurpers, tyrants, and what's worse, to fright the animals and kill them up in their assigned and native dwelling place, unquote. As you like, its three political animals are radical animals. They claim an authority of their own. They question servitude. They're beyond any human master or they desire to be. In Renaissance political theory, after all, there is nothing worse than a tyrant. The last three animals in Shakespeare to fill out our eight bear philosophical and cosmological heft, but with a twist. In The Merchant of Venice, one animal appears when Gratiano addresses Shylock on the question of the transmigration of souls. Quote, thou almost makest me waver in my faith to hold opinion with Pythagoras that souls of animals infuse themselves into the trunks of men." Unquote. Here, Pythagorean transmig transmigration, transmigration of the soul, and Shakespeare uses this like many other Renaissance uh, writers. If you believe in that, you are the craziest you could possibly be. Like Pythagorean views under, are often used to make you look like a madman. If you would believe that, you would believe anything. Okay? But here it appears in a very sober kind of context. Here the Pythagorean transmigration is partly re-envisioned within the terms of Judeo-Christian moral judgment. The wolf is bad. Okay. But though the wolf that Shylock is being compared to is cast as morally bad, he still has something to call a soul. That's the Merchant of Venice. Next we go to Hamlet. When Hamlet is sarcastically faking madness for Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, he first calls man, quote, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, unquote. But he turns on a dime to deflate this language. And yet, man delights not me. And the last of the eight, comes from King Lear in his cosmic crisis on the heath. Everybody knows these lines too. Uh, Thou owest the worm no silk, the beast no hide, the sheep no wool, the cat no perfume. Thou art the thing itself. Unaccommodated man is no more but a poor bare forked animal. Um, and, then he, and then Lear takes off his clothes, so takes off the, the lendings that are all taken from animals. 
King Lear classifies what he calls unaccommodated man as a poor, bare, forked animal, which is to say man is insufficient by an animal standard. Poor means born without knowing what to do, being a baby, having to be nursed, having to be educated. Bear means naked, and it raises a really interesting question, is there any other creature that's ever naked except people, in the way we can talk about this? Uh, forked, also very interesting. Um, the vaunted uh, bipedal status, the upright posture of man, a traditional index of his divinity, is kind of flipped here, and it just means two legs, forked. And of course, it sounds like a forked tongue and satanic and, and so on. Poor bear forked animal makes man an insufficient animal. For King Lear, only the appropriated coats and borrowed practical knowledge of other creatures equip a pathetically underprovisioned humankind for the world. We alone are naked. All the other creatures are understood to have been born prepared. That's what it looks like to come into this earth prepared. <laughs> Shakespeare deviates from his customary vocabulary of creature or beast then, using animal specifically when he asks what we might, what we might do well to call the question of the human. He does not use it when animality is asserted. There's another well-clad, uh, provisioned creature um, coming into the world not naked. In King Lear, it is man instead who is found lacking, despite the contemporary generality of finding animals to have a signature deficit. Um, how much time do we have? A few more minutes? Uh, okay, as a final matter, I'm going to end this up, um, a word about some of the ethical effects of this different way of talking about the forms of animal life in the sheer absence of an abstract generality like the word animal. Not unlike Darwinism, the traditions of classical natural history and of the creation story alike proposed joint origins for humans and animals in a common process that unfolded on a grand scale. Both of these traditions incorporate the major premise that animals are supposed to be here. The theological gap between that classical material and Christian doctrine was softened by the fact that either nature or God could stand as the name for what early, one early modern historian could even call, almost prefiguring Darwin, our common parent, unquote. As a result of these two powerful accounts working together, as narratives in which humans and animals originate in one common process, early modern thinkers like Shakespeare routinely understood a condition of membership and mutual participation to hold across species, instead of simply stressing the divide so, reflect, so reflexive for us. Um, I'll stop there. I'm about to take questions. Thank you very much. Hi. How you would comment of apparent duality of relations between humans and animals if in Shakespeare time, animals considered like um, not divine and very low organism and humans is, human is divine. But their relations were very close as you show by your pictures. And now by Darwin and other DNA sequencing studies, we know that human basically animals biologically, but their relations became much more distant. So I see some antagonistic duality in this, that you really think about animals as lower kind of um, subjects. You have better relations with them, and now then you know you basically like develop animal, you have relations became worse. Thanks. Um, I think that I, I want to be clear that, that animals were not cast as equals to humans by any means. But they were, if you, think about, if you think about the dispensation in Genesis, which is so important for this period, because Genesis was read as a science text too, right? It was a natural history that gave an account of how many kinds there are and how they came to be here. And so 
what you see, I mean, and this is the lawyer side of me looking at this. I read Genesis, and I've found a lot of evidence in both Calvin and Luther's commentaries on Genesis to show that they read it both as natural history, but also kind of the way we think of reading a constitutional document. So what you see in Genesis, and you know, I thought I knew what was in that uh, until I started really looking at it from this standpoint and reading Calvin and Luther in their commentary, and also Montaigne in his commentary on Genesis. Um, the account of creation has animals coming first in time. Okay? And first in time is, especially if you think of like tenure in legal claims or domain or dominion claims, first in time is significant. Okay? The fact that they came first in time is often glossed as, you know, they were sort of preliminary, they were waiting to be the receivers of man. Um, but what's really, really interesting in the passage that I read from Genesis 1.30, right, that accords to all animals and fish, birds, and beasts, the green herb shall be for meat, okay? And it's in 129, gives the green herb for meat to humans, okay? So 129 says, you human guys, you get to be vegetarian and, and the plants are for you to eat, okay? The next passage doesn't address animals, but it's talking about them and says, birds, beasts, and so on, you too get exactly the same grant of the green herb for meat. And so at some level, what you can see in that is there are entitled beings, even though one cat category has authority over another, but the dividing line is below animals and pl plants are the commodity. Plants have no rights, plants have no entitlement. And so what's really very interesting in the 16th century, of course, everybody was killing everybody else over the subject of religion in, during the Reformation. And what I found in my research is that on, if you take the Catholic side, Michel de Montaigne, not highly orthodox in, in any way, but certainly not a Protestant, you take Montaigne or you take Calvin, oh, sorry, both of them read Genesis as a political document in that sense because they see the story of the fall, okay, and Noah's Ark and so on. Remember at the landing of Noah's Ark, fear and dread are imposed on the animals with respect to humans. It's the first moment, there's um, reams of discussion about what it all means, but it's the first moment when uh, carnivorousness is authorized. There is killing before then, but there's silence between the green herb, you people, shall be your food, and then the, the post-Noah's Ark dispensation. Anyway, for 16th century writers so worried about monarchical tyranny, they had a matrix for that narrative, right? That's where ethical monarchy in Eden falls into political tyranny where the tyrant literally treats his subjects as food to, for, to eat them up. Um, and so that's how they read it. So lower definitely, but not below that line. Yeah. Madame, your scholarship has outherited Herod. Your sorry? scholarship has outherited Herod. I'm sorry, I can't. Well, that's okay. Yeah. I was gonna say, outstanding program. I would have liked to have heard uh, a little more of Shakespeare uh, in the program. Um, every, uh, the cat will mew and every dog will have his day. The yeah. thing that would enhance this program is for the, uh, have some sign language available and having captions available for us who are in the hearing loss community. Thank you. Okay. Does somebody have a question? Thank you for that absolutely erudite presentation. I really appreciated what you said. I've never heard anything more uh, academically deep, and I've heard a lot of that in my lifetime. Anyway, my question is this, um, and I'm a little reluctant to ask it because I think I must have missed a connection somewhere. Your initial presentation was about how 
not until after Descartes was the term animal used, and yet <coughs> your examples were mostly from Shakespeare and the, and, okay. and the naming of animals. So please explain that. It's, it's not that it was never in English beforehand. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it. There's a thing on Google that you can do now called Google Ngram, N-G-R-A-M. Um, and what it enables you to do is map the frequency of words. That's not how I first did it, but this is another kind of evidence that I didn't talk about. Um, I mean, anima goes all the way back to Latin. Animal is the adjectival inflection for ensold, okay? And it comes into English via the Romance languages and Latin. It's not that there are zero instances of the word animal before that time, but rather, if you take Shakespeare as a database, some people take him that way, and for these purposes we can take him that way, um, and it also works for Montaigne and a couple of other authors that I've done this test with, um, Shakespeare uses, invariably prefers to use, beast or creature, okay, so that, that word, variants of beast and variants of creature appear almost 300 times in the corpus of Shakespeare's text. Animal appears only eight times, okay? And so I'm interested in the rarity of the word, right? Which is now our only word. We would never say beast except if we were being all renaissance -y, right? You know, we, we say animal, that's our default. Sometimes we remember that includes people Sometimes we just mean not people, non-human animals. Um, when, you do the, when you run this in Google, what you can see is that <clears throat> animal is on the rise. You start to see the first uses in English during roughly Shakespeare's career. There are a few earlier ones. Um, but the 1590s is where suddenly it appears, but it's not common, it's rare. Um, and by the time you hit 1675, okay, so almost 100 years later, the frequency of the appearance of the word animal in printed text eclipses beast. So their lines cross kind of between then and now in some ways. Um, and so with Shakespeare, the, what's really interesting is that the couple of times, I mean eight is not a lot of times, that he uses it uh, he's actually using it about people, but to undercut any notion that the human is the most fantastic thing that ever was. It's actually uh, appearing in ways that Shakespeare is questioning all of the vaunted specialness of the human. And I think that's uh, not only religious, but it is certainly significantly theological, uh, coming out of a, a picture of humankind that is very capable of imagining, a, imagining us as a disaster, as a species, um, which is kind of full circle uh, to where we are now with eco-critical studies, for example, understanding the effect of humans as largely disastrous in terms of, of planetary stuff. So it's very interesting to think those together. Thanks. Yes, thank you for your presentation. You know, in Shakespeare, there are examples of beasts. I'm thinking, for example, of Caliban and the Tempest, where Othello makes references to these exotic right. enemies. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the distinction between the beasts that show up in Shakespeare and the animals that you spoke about this evening. Yeah. Um, Caliban is, is specifically called a creature. Um, and uh, he's called a four-legged fish and, and all the kind of great four leg, two legs, wings, fish, uh, quadruped, stuff gets all mixed up with him. Um, and beast, narrowly construed, means livestock, but of course, uh, like any of these words, creature, beast, or animal, can also refer to humans even then, right? So Shakespeare's, when he says beast, it's not always about an animal, right? It's often about people. Um, so all three words share the same flexibility um, in application to human or, or animal cases, um, but the word animal is more exclusively invoked by Shakespeare anyway uh, as a sign that the human is kind of wobbling on its two legs, if that makes sense. 
Um, I, gave, I went through the list of, uh, obviously very partial list, of the animals mentioned in Shakespeare. I mean, no contemporary writer will ever match the frequency of animal uh, images or animal appearances uh, to a 16th century text. It's just, uh, especially an imaginative text like that. Um, because, you know, uh, animals were, butchered animals were hanging everywhere around. Uh, animals, livestock were free in the streets. Um, I said I would talk a little bit about pigs and their liability for murder, um, but there are roughly um, 250 odd cases. They're continental, French and Italian and a couple of other countries where non-humans are tried under different theories of legal liability. Um, the pig cases are um, usually because a gigantic pig smashed a kid, right? Uh, and so the pig, pigs uh, were hung on the town gallows after trial, after you know the whole thing. Lots of, not lots, but some of them did get off. And the fact that you could get off as a pig being tried for murder is very significant because it shows you that it's not just like some ritual that we need to read anthropologically, but there could be a legal procedural or substantive reason, the innocence of these piglets while their mom did this terrible deed, the little piglets got off because they didn't participate, da, da, da. Um, so the, the other kind of case that you see this coming up in um, is even more interesting than quadruped murder cases um, where quadrupeds are treated as murderers. Um, and that is in bug cases. There's a very important case in legal history where green weevils have invaded a vineyard in Saint-Julien. So you know what we are talking serious wine, okay? Green weevils have taken over the vineyard and what happens is the, the town, the syndics of the town, because it's a kind of commune in, in the way the vineyard was then owned, um, protest, they, they file a complaint against the weevils who are then assigned eminent legal counsel who represents them. And I make a long story short, the procedural history of this is just cool. But um, to make a long story short, that passage that I've been quoting you from Genesis about the green herb being given, authorized, delegated to creatures for their food, the bugs win <laughs> on that chapter and verse. Okay. The bugs win that case. And in, in fact, if you get into the record of the case, Opposing counsel argued for that other provision about we have authority over them, but the uh, defendant Weevil's counsel successfully argued they're entitled to a rational amount of food. If they stay for 40 years, maybe that's excessive, but it's here, it's in the book. Okay. And that book went into the case law because there was all kind of interesting stuff about what notice you have to give weevils to show up in court, um, what, what it all means. But in any case, there you see one piece of Genesis played against another piece of Genesis. It's treated as if it were statutory law. And indeed it was because our narrow modern idea of man-made statutory law is not historically relevant to the 16th century where they understood human law as like a lame imitation of divine and natural law and we're so terrible that we need extra laws to kind of keep us on the rails. Yeah. We have time for one last question here. No, I mean, that's what's so interesting about it. these were These were civil courts um, and the um, bug cases were regular civil courts and the pig cases were criminal cases, right? The felonious pig. But this is, this is an action for trespass. 
uh, against the weevils. Um, and there were curly cues on it with like the waste of the crop and so on. There were stages where they were bargaining, possibly we're going to settle this case by finding land elsewhere for the weevils to go. And the weevils council's like, that place is barren. You can't send my guys there. This is not good. It's, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. And it's baffled legal historians. You know, are we supposed to read this seriously? Are we supposed to just understand this as some weird cultural ritual? And, you know, I think that if you reconstruct the intellectual context where Genesis meant this to these people, it's to be read seriously and not just as a, a ritual that we don't need to think bugs could be equal under the law, as they are in that case. They win. That's it for today. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you, Laurie. Thanks.